Oh, you're welcome. All right. Um, Lucy wanted to know who was introducing tonight's speaker. Um, I decided I'd do it because everybody in this room has blackmail material on me. Um, I've done a lot of jobs. They've all had to do with data, um, <clears throat> including the Hollywood Script Consulting Project, which I am glad to talk to you about over a beer. Currently, I work in the jump division at SAS Institute as what is called a research statistician developer. And so it is my job to make the software, right? And it is also my job to research new methods to put into the software. And research statistician developer probably has the most words of any title I've ever done, but it's actually descriptive, right? I'm a research statistician. I'm also a developer. And one of the things that I've really like become responsible for is the black box that happens in your statistical software. So I don't, and maybe, maybe only I got this version of, of stats education in your undergrad, but, and in graduate school for that matter, until I got my PhD. Um, data goes in, stuff happens, numbers come out, right? Like that was, that was pretty much what I was taught. And you know, so you spend a little time down here on the parameter estimates and you look for the p-values, right? Maybe you look at this p-value over here. Um, but all of the stuff about how your model is working and whether it worked is in these two little tables that nobody spends any time on. I mean, I don't know if you had that experience, but whenever I tried to ask nosy questions about what was going on in here, the, um, the basic response I got was, it's too hard for you to understand, right? And, and so I got two graduate degrees, and the first graduate degree was, it's still too hard for you to understand, don't worry about it. The second graduate degree was, I understand this so well, I really can't explain it to you. I don't know why you don't just know it already. <laughs> So finally, I got a job as a software developer, and suddenly this made sense, right? Because I was responsible for every number that's in the table, and so I had to develop an intuition about when they were good numbers and when they were bad numbers. Because now when the numbers are bad, it could have been me, right? I used to be able to just say your data must be wrong and it's all your fault, but not anymore. It could be my mistake. So we're going to talk about those tables that don't get as much attention <clears throat> excuse me, when you're, when you're learning your STAT 101 or even your, probably your graduate stats, applied stats course. And one of the things you discover once you really start spending some time with this is that those are windows into what's going on in the optimization. Those are windows into how this works. Okay. All right, so let's get started. Um, the, there are different ways to optimize, right? There are different kinds of optimization strategies. The one you see mostly is the one that's up top. Follow these steps and stop when you've made this function as large or small as you can make it, okay? Um, the individual steps aren't as important. We'll talk about the individual steps a little bit, but understanding the function and how the function works and understanding how that process goes is really, really helpful. We're gonna briefly touch on two other types of optimizations, one of which is trail the possibilities, show me the best ones. And just, just do this for a while and summarize the answer. Okay, all right, so. Now, the interesting thing about the first kind of optimization is that it's, it's been around for a long time. So the idea is to find a mathematical function that expresses what you want. So it's, it's a math function, it's one function, right, that produces a single number that takes all the stuff you know, which is your data, and relates it to the stuff you don't know, which is, in, which is the parameters. So that Greek letter in there, that beta hat, that's the thing I don't know. Y and X are data values that I have. And the one you see most often is this sum of squares error idea, right? And if you've done statistical analysis, you've seen a sum of squares error table, you've seen, a, you've seen, a, you've seen the, um, <clears throat> statistics based on this number. 
it really is one number. And the computer's job is to make that one number as small as it, as small as it can be made by finding a vector of parameter estimates that, that mi minimize that function. Okay. Um, a lot of the work in optimization, if you create a new model, is proving that the right values are the ones that minimize the function. It's proving that if I am at the minimum, all the good stuff that's supposed to happen happens. Okay. So why was least square so popular? And you can see, I'm going to give Gauss the credit for it. Um, there's, it's a little bit disputed, but um, trust me, it's Gauss, right? <laughs> all right. The great thing about least squares and what made it so popular, if you think about it, this is 1809. There, there are no computers, right? Not really. Um, nobody, so, so all the fancy stuff we're used to doing is not available. Gauss was actually able to make a recipe for if you do these things, you are going to get to the minimum. And that's why least squares was so popular to start with. <coughs> that's why it's still so popular now. So let's start there. I'm going to go to jump. I'm going to see if it's going to let me use jump. Yeah, that's our dodgeball team. That's a good looking group of people. Aren't they handsome? Aren't they just? That guy right in the middle. <laughs> He's my favorite, too. All right, I think it's going to make me exit, so bear with me. All right, there we go. All right, <coughs> control plus. Let's make the font big. Come on, jump. Uh oh. All right, can you guys see the font? Yeah. All right. Yay for huge screens. <laughs> All right. So here we've got an example with grandfather clocks. I am going to open up something called Graph Builder. And what I want to see is the relationship between the age of the grandfather clock and the price. That is the prettiest straight line relationship you will ever see. They don't get any better than that in nature. OK? So you know, the age of the clock, how old it is, is a pretty good determinant of the price. There's probably other stuff there. You can see one of them at the upper left, the number of bidders. right? But what I want to talk about is the science of fitting that line. We're so used to seeing it. But back in 1809, how that line got fit was a major research puzzle. They were like, how the heck do we do this? And so Gauss's insight was that, well, if you, you, know, you kind of pretend you have a line, and that line has an intercept and a slope, the vertical distance between each of those points and the line is kind of a measurement of how off you are. Okay. So that's your error. Some errors are negative. Some errors are positive. Well, negative or positive, I don't really care, right? So I'm going to square each of those errors. I could take the absolute value. Absolute values are nasty. Don't, no, derivatives are impossible. Don't like it. Square each one. So you square each of the errors. You add them all up, OK? And that's your function. That is your magic function. You minimize that function, the sum of squares error, and voila, you have <laughs> you have a model. Okay. So now if you take a look at that summary of fit table, let me see if this one will get bigger. Zan, do you have any advice? Not to put you on the spot. Control plus is not doing it tonight. Shift. Shift plus. Oh, see, I knew it was, I knew problem exists between Ooh. keyboard and screen. There we go. Thank you, Zan. <laughs> it was nice of you not to speak up before I asked. I appreciate it. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so once you, I mean, once you kind of view it from that way, right, I've got a function. That function takes all of my data into account. It produces one number that I'm trying to make as small as possible. You can find that number in this table. It's right here. It's the sum of squares error. Okay. Sitting right there. Okay. That's how well I did. Okay. Now, 
people started looking at this, right, and this was revolutionary and great, and we absolutely loved it, and we were so excited. Um, but somebody said, well, OK, so I have this data table that was created by instruments that have a lot of measurement error. And I have this other one with better, better instruments, right? But the variables are different, but I want to compare them, right? So some data is noisier than other data. But I want to be able to compare the two models. What can I do? And somebody said, all right, look, think of the dumbest model you can think of. Okay. Figure out the sum of squares error for that one. That's the corrected total. Now take the ratio for your model, which should be better, right, and the dumbest model you can think of. Okay. That ratio is the R squared. So that R squared at the top, right, it's a ratio. Corrected sums of squares is always bigger than your sum of squares error from your real model. Even if your real model is not very good, it'll always be a teensy bit bigger. R squared has a range between 0 and 1. Numbers near 1 are good. Numbers near 0 are not as good. And so you can take two different models. You can look at their R squared side by side and say, better, worse, about the same. Okay, Rule of thumb. All right, but it all comes out of that optimization. <clears throat> okay. And and Jump, which is a marvelous product. I can't take any credit for anything you're going to see tonight, but check that out. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, in case you forgot what the sum of squares error is, you fly your mouse over it and we tell you. Yeah, Jake. <laughs> uh, just to ask a question about uh -huh. thinking about the model that would be the worst, right? Mm -hmm. so we, I can draw a line. First thing that comes to my mind is I could draw it at the bottom of all the line, of all the dots, right? And then it's going to be quite a bit of distance. But then I could go back farther and farther, and I can go infinitely far away. So how do you actually come up with, with the worst? I, I'm sorry. The dumbest model you can think of might not be the right way to describe it. The, the easiest model you can think of. So the easiest model you can think of, if you don't know anything about the, about the outcome, other than if all you had was your y vector, <laughs> right? All you had was the response. The best thing to guess is the average. So, you do that. so that's the corrected total. You, you pretend the x's aren't there. Yeah, you literally draw a straight line, a horizontal line at the mean. That's your stupid model, your naive model. We'll call it the naive model. Okay. Yes. Yes. Good question. Yeah. That's the worst model you can do. The worst sensible model you can get, do, I guess. Okay. I didn't think of a lot of terrible models, to be fair. All right. Okay. All right. I'm going to clean my desk. going to go back to this. <coughs> oh, you didn't. No. Bad. Wrong. OK. All right. So there's that. OK. All right, so the least squares formula is actually a recipe. So the cool thing about least squares is that there's always an answer. You always get there the same way. And back when computers were really slow and couldn't do a lot, Having just one formula was amazing, right? So if you think of, if, if you do the matrix math, and if you don't, you know, if you, if you failed out of linear algebra twice the way I did, don't, don't get too hung up on this, right? Um, that x prime x to the minus 1 matrix times x prime y, all right, you will see that all over the place. It's the solution. If you take the first derivative of this one, set it equal to 0, solve for beta hat, that's the solution you come up with. And in grad school, if you, take, if you get a PhD in statistics, they will make you do that. Two or three times, different ways. <laughs> All right. And, and so, and again, you declare victory. All right. So that's a recipe, right? If it's a recipe, how could it go wrong? It can never go wrong, can it? Right? Linear models are always perfect. All right. Let me show you how it can go wrong. Okay, so this is here for the documentation. When I share my slides, you'll have it. All right. I'm going to go back to jump, and I'm going to open up my Arts Survey Core 1. 
oh no, I'm not. I'm going to open my bowling alley data. There we go. All right. So this is a least squares model from a survey. It's actually a panel survey. Um, it's a really fun data set. Okay. This is actually a terrible model. Um, this is one of the bad models I thought of. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to relate whether or not you went to a library. That's the library. Hi, guys. Did you get lost? No, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. There are, there are seats here and here, over there. There are some chairs. If you want to pick them up and go to the back, I understand. <laughs> Someone's lonely back there. You can go sit with your friend. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so <laughs> what I'm trying to do is figure out, OK? I'm trying to use whether or not you've, how many books you've read in the last year, and how many times you've gone to the library in the last year. Um, what they're doing is they're asking this question over and over, right? So they ask it in 1975, they ask it in 1976, they ask it in 1977. What I'm trying to do is see if these two things are related to year, if I can use them to predict which year you asked. Okay, this is the model I get, and I, I get something that's fairly statistically significant, you'll notice the R squared is really awful, right? <laughs> Just saying. And one of the tricks you learn to play when you're, when you do this long enough and you get, you get, you make mistakes enough times in front of customers that you get embarrassed enough to do your homework. Um, <laughs> One of the tricks you can pull, right, Bruce, <laughs> is you'll take something out of the model and see what changes. So I removed library. So this model just says book. Wow, the parameter estimate for book went through the roof <laughs> compared to where it was. Now it's statistically significant. What's going on? Well, gosh, well, let me go to this other one and remove library. Oh God, the R squared doesn't change at all. What is going on here? Okay. So, so here's the thing. I'm trying to relate library and book to year. All right. So this is another way to look at the relationship between library and year. Okay. This is what they call a tornado plot. Okay. So, what you're looking for is for the bars to shift down the years. Library and year, not related. Li whether and how many times people went to the library doesn't seem to predict year. Year and book, maybe a little more related. Maybe not. You know what's a really good predictor of whether or not you went to the library? Whether or not you read a book. <laughs> right. This is a case where the x's are more related to each other than they are to the outcome. In my, in my professional opinion as a statistician, this is one of the things that, can go, that goes wrong all the time. Right? Like this is grade A number one, easy mistake to make. Right? <coughs> if you were working for me, you would not get fired for this one because I know how often it happens. Right? <coughs> OK. All right. The mathematical explanation is that when you, when you do this thing where you multiply x against itself and then try to invert it, that x prime x matrix is unstable. Okay. Principal components is something that helps you figure out how related your x's are to each other. A lot of people spend tons and tons of time looking at their outcome and spend very little time looking at their predictors and how their predictors relate to each other, which is reasonable because usually you have tons and tons and tons of predictors in one response, right? And the response is the important thing. Um, every time optimization goes wrong, it's usually this, or your software developer made a very bad mistake. Okay. Questions? Doing general linear models, mm -hmm. and you find that you're a whole bunch of stuff and that may or might or might not have different values or might be all zeros, uh, then that unconditioned matrix problem. 
we will see an example of that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the relationship of the x's, the relationship of the predictors to each other, no matter what kind of model you're running, that's a place where optimization can go wrong. Hey, guys, grab a seat. Hey, Jake. Yes. So, so is the basic idea that, that you don't want any of the x's to be correlated? Yeah, that's a whole talk. OK. Yeah, the question is, do I want the x's to never be correlated with each other? That is a big, long talk. Um, there's stuff called ridge regression, which is actually meant to deal with correlated x's. Um, we're going to see something called the lasso, which is also pretty interesting. Um, a lot of data mining is trying to, to figure out which ones make a good model. Um, principal components analysis is your friend, and almost any statistical package will have it. It's the simplest thing you can do, and, and you get a lot of bang for your buck. Yep. Yes, Mark? Uh, bowling alone? Yeah, that's what it's called, the bowling alone data. It's a, it's a panel survey on just stuff like, did you get into a fist fight last year? It's, it's a really amazing little survey. It's just commonly referred to in the industry as bowling alone. That, that, is, that is what I have heard it called. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah it's good. Good. Uh, Robert Hutton. Yeah. Well, that's one of the questions. <laughs> that's one of the questions in the survey about the Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. That's right. About interaction. Oh, wonderful little survey. And I'm, I would love to read the book. I haven't read the book yet. But, OK. All right. Least squares is relatively easy. It's relatively easy to understand. Everything's, you know, you can think about it as curves in space, right? You're drawing, you're trying to draw some sort of relationship. You know, you can get to two dimensions where you've got two x's. And then you start thinking about, like, changing the shape through the space if you really love that stuff and you're spatially oriented. Um, it depends on a couple of assumptions. The main thing is that the outcome has to be continuous. So it doesn't work well for counts. Doesn't work well for it does not work at all for yes no. All right. Um, also requires those little EIs to be independent. Okay. We're not going to talk about that tonight because we're focusing on the optimization. But um, the mixed models world is all about the rows in the table aren't independent. Now what do I do? I'll, I'll discuss the answer briefly, but first we have to talk about uh, likelihood. Yes? You always show linear models. Uh, it's not necessarily linear. Everything you said about nonlinear, right? Yeah, the question is, is everything I said valid for nonlinear models? Yes, except the optimization routine is different. But all the stuff about making sure that the predict you minimize, you minimize the sum of squares error. That is correct. All right. And except you have a function of the x's. So the x's have a different relationship to y. Yes. yes. And there are different types of least squares. And one of the ones is there's a special optimization routine for nonlinear least squares, but there's actually no recipe for it. You have to, you have to actually run it through an optimization program, which we're going to talk about. So least squares has a recipe, all right? Linear least squares has a recipe. That if you take nothing else away from this, linear least squares has a recipe. Sum of squares er error is basically <coughs> the optimization's report card. This is how I did. This was the number I got after I ran my formula. Linear in the parameters, that is correct. All right, <coughs> OK. Most people, again, you, you're not going to be able to stop at linear models, OK? You just, I mean, maybe you can. And, and if so, that's awesome. But generally, that's not where it goes, all right? A lot of times, you're going to want to model the probability that something happens given a set of conditions. So we're going to call this something y equals 1. It's an event. I'm going to denote it in my table as y equals 1. I can, I can code y not equal to 1 as anything else, right? Because there are only two possibilities. It happens or it doesn't, OK? The conditions are going to be called x. And we want to figure out which x is most important. So we're going to create these things called weights, which are called beta, OK? Very similar so far, OK? 
Lots and lots of yes, no questions, right? All kinds of stuff. Will the Panthers win the Super Bowl? I guess not. <laughs> Easy to predict that now, right? <laughs> is my loan gonna, is, is this loan gonna go to collections, right? Is this customer gonna leave me, all right? Will this website visitor buy something, okay? Really important business questions that given the technology Mr. Gauss had in, in 1809, impossible to answer because the outcomes of probability, probabilities are bounded between zero, one, zero and one. Okay, we needed something new. We needed something better. Okay, all right. So, and we didn't have anything better until 1912. And Mr. Doctor, he would be very sad if I didn't call him doctor. Dr. Fisher came up with this. And he said, well, look, yeah, maybe, maybe you could call your probability that y equals one, this little linear model that we've dealt with all this time. But let me try something else. I need a number between zero and one, okay? One over one plus E. Does anybody know what E is? Two point something, something, something. Two will work, right? All right, E to the minus, and there's my linear model. Xi beta, right? Okay. When this thing that I'm doing the minus of, when it gets bigger and more positive, what happens to E to the minus that thing? shrinks. And this number, the whole number, the probability gets closer to 1, right? Okay. When this number gets negative, starts going more and more and more and more negative, further and further away from 0, what happens to the thing on the bottom? Gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what happens to the whole function? Gets closer to 0, right? It's exactly what you want if you want to model a probability, a binary outcome, right? Y is one or it isn't. <clears throat> so then all we needed was a way to maximize it, right? And there are lots and lots of ways to transform X beta so that you get a probability out. This is the classic one. It's the first one they'll teach you in grad school when you go get your PhDs, all of you, right? Okay, all right. So, so Dr. Fisher was like, all right, I'm going to give you a function called a likelihood. Okay. And it's going to have this little equation. It's going to include all the times y is equal to 1 and all the times y is not equal to 1. And now all we have to do is maximize it. Sit, sit, and we're done. Anybody know what happens when you take a probability and multiply it by another probability and multiply it by another probability and multiply it by another <laughs> You get this really tiny number that the computer can't even keep track of anymore because it's so bitsy. Okay, all right, so, so maximizing that thing directly is actually really messy and difficult. Okay, we can't do that. How about this, all right? How about we take the natural log of the probabilities? Okay, natural logs are real nice transformations. Okay, I'm gonna take the natural log of this number. Now we get to add them instead of having to multiply them. Okay, and we'll, we'll work with numbers that, that are a little bit easier for the computer to handle. Um, anybody know what happens when you take the natural log of a number between zero and one? Negative. It's negative, yes. So the natural log of anything less than one is negative. Even more than that, least squares minimized. And everybody was all about the least squares at this time, all right? That was all they'd ever done. That was all they believed in, right? So they were like, can't we have something that looks like least squares? Can't we have a function we can minimize? Well, sure, just minimize the negative of, or just minimize the negative of the natural log, okay? So if you're trying to maximize a function that's way negative, right, you're trying to push it towards zero, so if you minimize the positive version of that, right, you're trying to push it towards zero. But now it's a positive number, okay? It takes up a little less room in the report. You don't need the negative sign. That's awesome, <laughs> all right? But now there's no easy recipe. Um, sometimes there's an easy recipe. Usually there isn't, right? You take the derivatives of this thing, you set them to zero. You might, you might get a good answer. Generally, you don't. So now, now you've got to do something else. You've got to 
have a way for the computer to figure out where the minimum is. Um, this, is a, um, this is actually a picture of a maximum. My bad. Same deal. Okay. You tell it, start somewhere. Figure out what the slope is in all the directions you could head. Go, go toward the positive slope, biggest positive slope you can get. Okay. Keep going. When you start going downhill, stop. Or if you're just kind of doing this, stop. Okay, if the function's not going anywhere, stop changing it. Ta-da, this must be it. Okay, this is the good spot. So, so what happens, so again, 99.9% .9 of the time, when you run a model that is not a linear, um, a linear model, okay, what is happening behind the scenes is that the computer picks up starting point and it runs some sort of, usually it's called gradient descent. There you go, you can go home and tell your spouse and your children you learned about gradient descent. I guarantee they will not ask any other questions, all right? <laughs> But gradient descent says, okay, we're going to figure out what the slope is, and we're going to we're going to figure out where to go next based on the multi-dimensional slope of this function. We're going to take a step. There are all sorts of marvelous, marvelous things you can do to get the best answer, which are tons of fun, and we can talk about them later. Um, and then you stop when either the function's not going anywhere, right? So it's, you're changing things, but the function's not changing value. Or if there's nowhere positive to go. <laughs> That's OK. I've done that, too. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to another data set. This is one of my favorite data sets. All right. I have to escape out of here. All right. Let's get rid of the, oh, it's already up. All right, <laughs> close, Boop. all right. All right, um, this is the survey for public participation in the arts. Um, it's, um, it's part of the current population survey. And what it does is it asks people questions like, have you gone to an art museum in the last 12 months? If you went, how many times did you go? Right, questions like that. Um, did your spouse go to the art museum? And so these are, a lot of them are yes, no questions. Yes, no questions is a logistic model, generally. All right, so I decided, hey, let's, let's run a logistic model. Um, this, is, this is something you would see in Jump. You probably wouldn't see in a lot of other software packages. We give you a nice report on the parameter estimates at the top because that's what everybody's excited about. But you and I, these days, know that what we're really excited about is the negative log of the likelihood. Like, that's the money right there. OK, so again, now that we're all experts on least squares, <laughs> this makes perfect sense. All right, this is the minus log of the likelihood. We all know that we're trying to minimize the negative log likelihood, right? We're trying to make that number as small as possible. OK, the full model is, is the model that you actually submitted has different names at different times. The reduced model is the intercept only model. So again, it's the guess. It's the naive, I don't know anything about y except, except, what, except that it's y, and these are the values. Okay. You can take a ratio and get an r squared. Okay. Maximum likelihood, not as straightforward as least squares. And so there was this cottage industry for a while on all the different r squareds you could calculate. And what are they? I can't remember either. That's why they're here in this report. <laughs> OK? Because somebody said, gee, guys, it's hard to remember them all. And we said, you know what? You're right. We're going to stick them in the report with you so you don't have to keep checking the doc. OK. All right. But same idea. <clears throat> really beautiful and elegant. All right. Lack of fit tests again. All right, same, same sorts of stuff. I'm going to give you a saturated model. I'm going to give you a real model. Um, we're going to see a lack of fit is basically a, a probability test. It says, OK, saturated model. Um, we're going to throw everything we can possibly throw into this model. We're going to get the likelihood out of that one. We're going to compare it to the one you actually did. We're going to see if maybe there's something you're leaving on the table. Um, I guarantee there's stuff I'm leaving on the table because this is observed data on a survey 
you never ask all the questions you need to ask. <clears throat> all right. Maximum likelihood. Now you're all experts in maximum likelihood. Congratulations. All right. All right. OK. All right, popular question at this point should be, but gee, Melinda, least squares is easy. And you said there was stuff that could go wrong with least squares. What can go wrong here? Well, well let's think about it. OK, first let's do this slide that I forgot about. OK, <laughs> all right. Maximum likelihood is probably the most powerful and flexible version of optimization that you use in the statistical sciences. If you know least squares and you know maximum likelihood, you are in good shape. Right? We're going to talk about some other stuff, but these are the two that you see ordinarily in practice. Um, this is pretty much how you put a likelihood together. If anybody starts talking to you about something like a Poisson model, I did a Poisson model on count data. I did that for Jim, working with his data. What is that? It's a different likelihood. It just sounds cool because it's French. All right. All right. There are all kinds of ways that you take, you're like, oh, well, you know, I think this probability model is maybe a little bit different. Maybe we can model this a little bit better. A probit model, okay, people will have a logistic regression. Oh, no, we're special in the social sciences. We use probit regression. What is that? It's another likelihood. It's a different kind of likelihood. That's all it is. Maybe it does transform a little bit closer to what you need. But it's, it's not so special and magical that you can't figure it out. Okay. Most new models are just new likelihoods. Um, I mentioned lasso regression earlier. Lasso regression is, is the likelihood you've always had plus a penalty term. Okay. So remember, you're trying to minimize the negative likelihood. You're going to add a positive number to it. That positive number grows when you have more terms in the model. So if you're adding terms in that don't do anything for you, the likelihood goes up instead of down. That is, that's the whole idea behind lasso regression. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, but if you're a user of lasso regression, that's, that's what's going on. It's just a different likelihood. Once you have that window, a lot of this stuff gets much, much easier to learn. Okay. Um, another thing we've got, and this is a huge area for the statistical sciences, is new and better and fancier ways to maximize a likelihood. I have data on 14 different servers, Melinda. I'm Netflix. I need to make a decision in five minutes. I have a billion rows of data. I'm not going to drag it all to one server and run a likelihood function for you and spit it back out. I need an answer now. Well, I'm adding up natural logs. I guess you could add them up where they are and then send me the natural logs, right? I'll add them up here, make my decision about where to go next, and farm them back out, OK? I made that sound really easy. It's not, OK? But that's what's going on with grid computing. That is one of the things you can do with grid computing. Or, or hold on to your hats. No, Melinda, you know, I don't, I don't even want to have to send you the, na the answers, all right? No, I don't have time for that. OK, you've got enough data on every server. Give every server its own likelihood. Let it maximize its own likelihood. Send me the answer, and I'll combine them in some sort of fancy mathematical, maybe I'll use the words Bayesian model averaging, so you'll stop asking me questions, right? Right? It's, it's all likelihoods. Nine, again, 98% of the cases you're going to find, it's some fancy schmancy way of doing the likelihood function. <coughs> right. And yes, it can go wrong. Okay. Nice, smooth, pretty likelihoods are not always what you get in nature. And a lot of the optimization techniques depend on where you start. Okay. So if I start where that blue dot is, Okay. Whoops, uh, there's a better one, or maybe a better one, maybe a better one. There's also a worse one, right? Page down. Page up, sorry. PowerPoint, not my thing, all right? There's also a worse answer that I could have gotten to, right? 
Um, so there are ways to fix that. Um, you'll hear people grid searching for starting values. Again, if you have tons and tons of data, spreading it out and letting everybody find their own solution is another good way to do that. Again, glorious, glorious math on figuring out whether or not that's right. Okay. Again, for you guys, um, the way this usually goes wrong for most users of analytics is that there's something in that predictor matrix that's a bad idea, or there are two things that are a bad idea together. So this is um, me adding a variable. So the outcome is, did you go to an art museum in the last 12 months? Yes, no. And the predictor is, the, the magical predictor for that is number of art museums you visited in the last 12 months. <laughs> It's easy to laugh when you don't do it in front of a client. Um, <laughs> anyone who says they've never done this has either not done a lot of statistical models or they're lying. This, um, you know, because a lot of times they're labeled V1, V2, V7. Or you'll have something that's like, this one has no relationship to the outcome you're looking for. And you put it in, and all of a sudden it's a magical predictor. And it's like, oh, yeah, we code that one to go with that one whenever, you know. Um, Data's messy. <laughs> These things happen. Um, <clears throat> so, and one of the interesting things about Jump, again, I am not responsible for this part of the platform. I'm just a Jump fangirl. Um, a lot of optimization routines will actually just choke if you do something like this. And you'll get a note in your log. Raise your hand if you've heard this. Quasi-complete separation detected. Has anybody ever seen that in a log message? Yeah. Quasi-complete separation generally means there is something in your data that perfectly predicts your outcome, which is what this one does. Jump actually gave me an answer, because um, Jump is awesome and well-built, is, um, is, is, is what's going on there. Um, <laughs> so. <clears throat> All right. So a lot of the work in optimization is proving that you have a well-behaved function. Um, if you listen to a research statistician developer talk um, about their research, a lot of times they're going to spend a lot of time proving to you that the optimum exists um, for most problems and that you can find it. Okay, so if you come up with a new fancy model, you kind of have to prove that that likelihood is optimizable under reasonable conditions. Um, that is a non-trivial thing to do. Um, for a standard established method that you're using in a standard piece of software like R, like SAS, like Python's um, scientific packages, like Jump, well-behaved means that your data is working, okay? that your data isn't weird. All right? It doesn't have tons and tons of missing data that just get dropped. Um, your X's are not strongly related to each other so badly that um, you really can't detect an optimization. Um, those things I can't fix. So this is me waving my hands. Okay. Um, your software generally can't fix that. There is no substitute for knowing your data. Okay. Um, but again, you kind of learn what, what indicates it like, wow, that's one predictor that just like stomps all over the others. Maybe that's not real. <coughs> okay. All right. That is maximum likelihood. You are, you are allowed to ask questions now. Yes, Mark. If you do have local max, local max and local mins mm -hmm. as a problem, <coughs> are are there ways of tackling that particular that particular problem, Monte Carlo, or nothing other than grid searching? Grid searching is pretty much what you got. If you've got a lot of local maximums, local minimums, you're worried about that. Seconds of what means grid searching. Oh, I am sorry. Yes, grid searching. Grid searching means. Um, now you're going to make it not sound as cool, Bruce. Grid searching means try a bunch of stuff. Okay. <laughs> try a bunch of starting points, see which ones work. Um, there, there was a wonderful um, series on the SAS lift serve of all the different types of optimization, and which involved Dan. Remember this: the kangaroos, and Bowl. yeah, and bowling balls and, and, and kangaroos. <laughs> That's right. And so one of them was that the kangaroos, you would send all the kangaroos out. Eat, they would all jet ski to a, to a spot on the world, right? And, and then they would hop to the maximum. Each one would hop to its maximum. And, and, then, flood the earth. and then you flood the earth. So then all the kangaroos except the highest one drowns. 
And then he gets on his jet ski and scoots around looking for even higher points to see if there's any other high points left. It's really strange. It's, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the kangaroos drowning. I thought they all just swam up to the top. <laughs> but they, they have jet skis. Can't they just sit on the jet ski? And <laughs> I guess. Because then you could just send them all out skiing. That's terrible. OK, sorry. I honestly did not know the kangaroos drowned. I'm so sad. OK. <laughs> All right, OK. <clears throat> Speaking of grid searching and trying all the possibilities. All right, that is actually a kind of optimization. Try all the possibilities and show me the biggest, smallest. All right, you all have the seal of approval. You are maximum likelihood estimates. I am going to maximum likelihood experts. Maximum likelihood estimates are different. All right, I'm going to briefly show you two other kinds of optimization that are not nearly as exciting, but they do exist, and you should know about them. OK. One of them is just try everything. <laughs> okay. Try all the possibilities. Give me the best ones. Okay. Um, this is something called market basket analysis. And the thing about market basket analysis is that you've got all these discrete items. They have no relationship to each other. If you tried to build a design matrix out of it, if you tried to build an X matrix, it's this enormous, ridiculous matrix that is mostly zeros. Right. Mess to work with. Um, there are fancy things you can do with it these days, but when this was invented, it was like, I, never going to work, right? <clears throat> and the search space is discrete. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, wow, these four items occur together. People are always buying potato chips, pretzels, hot dogs, and beer. So if I can put the beer kind of centrally located where the potato chips and pretzels are, or if I can put my beer next to the potato chips and pretzels, right? When nobody else knows that's a place to be, I can sell a lot of beer, right? That's the classic example. But the problem is, in order to do that, you have to go through thousands and thousands and thousands of sets of items and individual items, okay? That search space is also what we call discrete, right? Um, you're combining different sets, set one, set two, set three, set four. So there's no, um, there's no smooth function with a pretty derivative. So what do you do? Well, this is what you do. <clears throat> um, lots of interesting papers written about this. You narrow down the search space, and then you try all the possibilities. Okay, so this is all the math on things like support and confidence, et cetera. But basically, you say, well, look, I don't care about anything that's not bought more than 1% of the time. If 1% of the people who buy things buy this thing, I'm interested in it. Otherwise, not. Okay, that already cuts down the search space by a lot. And then you say, and I'm really not interested in sets of items unless the group I'm trying to use to predict, I'm really not interested in sets of items unless they occur together a lot. And I'm not interested in the ones that occur together a lot unless my smaller set is predictive of my bigger set. Okay. So almost every one of these types of optimizations is bespoke for the problem. All right? It is tailored to the problem that you have. Page up. OK. All right. So that's a try all possibilities version. OK. Do this many, many, many times and then summarize the result. That is the other kind of optimization I will talk about incredibly briefly tonight. This is the Bayesian posterior distribution for the linear regression problem we saw at the very beginning of the night back at 7.15, before you guys were experts on least squares and maximum likelihood. Okay. This is the Bayesian version. This is a Bayesian version, I should say. I'm going to get so much hate mail from the Bayesian statisticians. Right. This is a posterior distribution that I stole from Wikipedia because I didn't want to type it. Okay. The appealing thing about Bayesian statistics, so remember a maximum likelihood says, I'm going to work on the probability of my response. 
given my data and my parameters. And I'm going to find the parameters that maximize that. Okay. The Bayesians say, well, you're interested in the parameters. Why don't you write a probability function that's the probability of the parameters and work with that? which is very appealing mathematically. Um, there's a lot of great applications for it. What you're seeing on the screen is why it's so hard. Okay. That math is very difficult. You want to maximize this function. You do want the most likely, so you want the posterior mode of that probability distribution. That probability distribution, however, is extremely complicated. Okay. The derivatives are messy when they exist. Um, traditional optimization really doesn't work for these. What else can we do? Okay. So again, you pick starting values. And you say, OK, I'm going to start here. I'm going to see how well this matches the data given the function that I have. From that equation, I'm going to develop an update equation, something that tells me what to try next. Okay. Then I'm going to try that thing. I'm going to go through the same thing. And then I'm going to go somewhere else based on what I just found out and keep going. All right, so they'll call that a, an MCMC chain. It is a chain of parameter values, parameter estimates. Okay? And the, the theory is you're going to do that for a while, and eventually you're going to get to the real distribution, the actual distribution. And then what you're doing at each step in that chain is visiting a different spot in the distribution. So you're basically filling in all you need to know about that posterior distribution. You save those answers, and then you have an empirical probability function from which you can get a mean, variance, a mode. But the main problem, and there's research on this, and I believe you know may, maybe they'll get there. There's no stopping rule. There's no way to know that your chain has converged to the steady state. Um, there's actually a couple papers by a physicist which are just wonderful examples of someone having a very angry scholarly argument where he talks about how you never know that you've converged. You never know that you're in the right spot. The next the next value could pop you to a new place entirely, and you could find out that you've never, ever, ever burned in. Okay? So the current practice is to run it for a long time, and then throw all those away, start where you are now, and then run it for a long time. Okay? There are many, many problems where this actually does work, and it works very well. Um, but it is very different from what's standard, right? And you don't get those model diagnostics that people are now used to seeing after 100 years of doing it this way. And that's, why it, that's one of the reasons it's not as popular. It's also not as popular because those priors are really complicated. Okay. Well, it's not popular in the statistical world because it's used a lot in computing for the A-B testing, for example. I'll take that. It's used in physics, too. MCMC methods are very popular in, in um, physics. Um, it is not as popular for everyday Bayesian analysis. I've actually never seen it used for A-B testing, either. I've only seen frequentist well, that's type the stuff. the theory behind A-B testing, that, that you start at a, a priori um, probability and then through the clicks, you know, where to go next. That, that is the most mathematical version of A-B testing I've ever heard, actually. <laughs> okay. It's also it's been used extensively to uh, revolutionize fan filtering. I mean, that iterative model and ability to take in new data is so, well, one of these that I've actually implemented before. So what you guys are talking about, OK, so that is probably the best example of where to use Bayesian statistics is with streaming data. Right, because there's no sense starting all over again. Right, I, I learned a whole bunch of stuff yesterday. I know everything's going to change tomorrow, and I've got this really mathematically pleasing way to update my prior knowledge. Okay, um, that that is totally reasonable from a computing standpoint. I I I would agree with that, and that's I mean that's the sort of stuff they use at Twitter. Um, 
Nobody knows what Google's really doing, so I, I shut. I'm. I'm <laughs> All right. okay. Other comments? See, the hate mail from the Bayesians is already starting. It's starting right here. <laughs> ah, yes, Markov chain Monte Carlo. My bad. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and that's why it's called a chain. Um, it's, it's too late for me to start talking about where the Markov chain really, it, we'll talk about that after I've had a drink. But. <laughs> But yes, that is that is what MCMC stands for. <clears throat> All right. So in closing, um, model diagnostics or optimization diagnostics. And so if you understand how the optimization works, I mean, even the very basics that we've talked about tonight, you are so much better off when you um, are trying to actually fit models to data. Um, least squares and maximum likelihood is sufficient for most applied work. And with the caveat that if you're working in a streaming environment, um, the Bayesian update stuff is, is actually very, very good for those environments, very useful. Um, so, so after four decades on this earth, I realized that all those people who told me, don't worry about what that table says because it's too hard for you, um, told me that because they didn't know what the table said. <laughs> so. Maybe everybody else already knows this, but if somebody kind of indicates that the answer to that question is too complicated, chances are they don't understand. You should go find someone smarter to ask, all right? If I can impart any wisdom to most of these people who know more than I do already, that is what I would say. The math is not too hard. It, you just have to be stubborn. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> Okay. Melinda. Yeah. Although I, I regret we didn't record you, you gave an excellent MCMC presentation at the Julia. I did. Group, I did. Like, oh, Thank you. Yeah, and I did talk about chain convergence there and, di and the, di the diagnostics that were in Julia. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Would you take on this stepwise regression? I wanted to see your face. <laughs> 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 um, so stepwise regression is where you select by p-value, right? So you, um, you try all the, all the predictors one at a time, and you pick the one with the best p-value. Okay, and p-value is, is a measurement of how far the parameter estimate is from zero. And then you say, all right, okay, that's the best one, right? I'm going to stick with that one, and now I'm going to try the set. I'm going to look for the second best one, given that that one's already in the model. Um, for very large data sets, it does not work well. Um, although I, I may have to eat my words, my friend Clay Barker figured out a way to do it with, um, with likelihoods using something called the score statistic. And so if you look for improvement in the overall likelihood, one variable at a time, it actually, according to Clay, and I did not check his math because Clay is smarter than me, um, it actually works better. It actually works pretty well. So, um, so all those harsh things I said to you about stepwise regression, I might have to take back. <laughs> it is. Um, it's a very way to. It's a very. So I would use a stepwise regression technique as an exploratory technique um, to see what's related to my outcome, um, and I don't think it's bad as an exploratory technique as a way to pick a final model. It's it's probably not the best because any stepwise technique you do does not take into account that those predictors are related to each other. And that's, that's the big downside. Yes? Um, it's more a more philosophical question. Uh, the optimization <coughs> assumes that you have a unique solution. That's correct. In most cases, uh, situation, you don't have enough data. You have too many predictors, mm -hmm. parameters, in other words. Yeah. So you don't have a unique solution, and probably doesn't make sense uh, you know, to have because uh, let's say you are describing a house of persons, so all of us here, you have different solutions, even though we all human. Yes. Right? So uh, what you do in that situation? You you take the parameter space. 
Yeah, so the, the question is about limited, limited data and infinite predictors, basically. That's, and, and, and the fact that every row in your table might have its own solution, might have its own parameter estimates. Um, so there, there is something in the um, maximum likelihood literature called a mixed model. Um, so you can use, so mixed models um, give you a chance to customize a little bit more than you would, um, than, than you could do in a, in a standard regression. Um, there's some great stuff in the genomics literature that I am not familiar with about, so in genomics, they've got a genome and they might have like eight patients. Right? So if you think about all those spots on the genome that they could have measured and, you know, whatever they want to know in the outcome, and they've only got this tiny little bucket of data, um, those guys have put together some amazing techniques for short, wide data sets. I am not an expert on that stuff, but there, there are, there's some stuff just in the last 10 years, last five years that's come up yeah, that's really amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But <clears throat> but that is not my field. <laughs> yeah. Can't be good at everything. Have to pick. <sighs> All right. Other questions? Yes. So um, if we have constraints on the parameters, then we have some, something like a linear programming problem. So so next talk you're going to do optimization. <laughs> In operations research? I am not doing a constrained optimization talk. Are you going to do a constrained optimization talk? Yeah, so, so you notice that as a statistician, I very much admire <coughs> R.A. Fisher's trick that's like, oh heck, we have a constrained optimization problem. Let's just do something smart to get out of it. Let's just escape, right? So. Dr. Fisher took the escape clause, um, and um, I, I follow in that proud line of statisticians. I haven't ever had to program a constrained optimization problem. Constrained optimization says there are places you just can't go. Like there are parameter estimates that are not considered possible. And what will happen, it, what's very easy to do is you get to a corner, right? You get to a spot where two, two of your constraints meet, and then you're, you're your optimization just does this, and um, smart people deal with that, and there's, there's a lot of great stuff in that area. Again, not, not an expert. <laughs> I, just, I just eliminate the data. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll never come back to haunt you. <laughs> yes. My experiences have been that um, if I use like a binomial thing, you know, it doesn't really make much of a difference anyway. And the way I've answered people like that in the past is to cite this one obscure paper I read that says it's not the normality of your data distribution, it's the normality of the error estimates from that's the right. model that's really important. That's right. And that usually shuts them up, but I'm not sure that I'm, that's a legitimate objection on my part. No, you're <laughs> Um, that's, I mean, yeah, so, so the, the question is about the assumptions for a, for a straight up linear, linear in the parameters regression um, and the assumption that the errors are normally distributed. Um, I would say that's an excellent response. You can have a not normally distributed outcome, but after you run it through that model, you can have normally distributed errors. That, that does happen. Um, I, <laughs> I do remember seeing once, though, and this is just something to have in the back of your mind, that process actually pushes the error terms closer to normality. Okay, <laughs> so, so the, the magic that happens inside that, that optimization function, it's trying to fit a model that is tailored for normal errors. So it's going to give you parameter estimates that produce the normalist errors it can get. Um, if you have the technology, as in if you have a software package, 
I'm going to stop plugging Jump someday. It, Jump, like you just say, I want a Poisson distribution. It goes right. Um, R will do one. We'll do it too. If you have a software package that can actually fit your Y the way it is, it's again if you because it's a maximum likelihood, you have to know how to deal with the output from a maximum likelihood model. But you're all experts now in maximum likelihood estimation, so so you're golden, Are you right? Kind of about <clears throat> not not so much curve fitting. So that's a completely different thing, right? If you're if if you do not have like if your data definitely does this, right? If you're talking about like a dose response curve, okay, you need a nonlinear model. There are nonlinear fitting packages. Okay, but if you're just talking about, well, why is not really normally distributed? It's accounts, so it's a Poisson, right? The technology is good enough at this time that you can fit a Poisson. Um, and it's a maximum likelihood model. If you know how to deal with a logistic regression, you, you are very, very close to being able to deal with the Poisson model. Um, there's something called a zero inflated Poisson model. So if you have a ton of zeros, you probably don't want to fit a straight line to that. You probably do want to deal with the fact that you have to basically model the probability you get a zero. And then if you don't, you model the count. Okay, that's, that's again, that's, a, that's a, a broader class of models. But it is a likelihood. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm going to free you. Oh, wait, one more. All right, one more. 